Hey folks, and welcome to the show. It is counterclipping show number 103 for December 19th, 2022. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for coming. Uh, tonight we are drinking a the generic um, uh, American style IPA from the uh, the advent calendar. Um, and it's it's okay. Uh, there's nothing really uh, nothing really outstanding or amazing about it, but it's not it's actually not as hoppy as I expected it to be. But we're still in the kind of voice is a little bit rough mode, so that is why we are uh, choosing a beverage that I can drink more volume of than scotch. Um, so we are clipping just Labatt markers. I am assembling, and I might do a video about this, uh, assembling the Labatt generic markers tray uh, for general purpose Labatai use. So uh, we, it's going to follow pretty much the same pattern that I use for OCS, which I have done a video on, um, where all the like generic system markers are in their own tray or pair of trays, as the case may be. Um, in this case, because the games tend to be large, it's probably going to be two trays, one for each side of the table. Um, not because I actually need that many different kinds of markers. It's actually, I mean, it's not a marker light system, but it's not a marker heavy particularly system either. The topic tonight, we have a big show tonight here. First of all, because of the topic, which is the big one, the best of Avalon Hill. This is tonight, we're going to cover, uh, we're going to do this chronologically tonight. Um, and we are going to, if all goes according to plan, we're going to go through 1954 to 1971. So we're literally going to go up to the year in which I was born. Um, before we get started and get on with our other news and other stuff, let me say that uh, the links to follow me on social media are all in the video description. I think I have Mastodon in there. That is the place where lots of people are right now are choosing over Twitter, which we're not going to get into. And I'd appreciate it if we didn't get into it in the chat. That would be great. Um, folks have their reasons. Folks have other folks have reasons for wanting to stay on Twitter. That's cool. But I'm on Mastodon. I have a separate uh, RPG setup at Dice Camp and a wargaming account at wargamers.social. Um, so if you uh, want to follow me there, those are the links. And if you would like to join the Discord server, let me put up the uh, ticker, which has been updated this week. Um, there is a link in the ticker to the Discord, the Ardwell Slayer Discord server. So hop on that if you want. Um, traffic has started to pick up. It's kind of, it, you know, there's a certain critical mass that you need to actually get people talking. And and we weren't at that for quite a while. Um, at least there wasn't much dialogue. There, there is starting to be a little more. So hop on, post, post, what you're, post pictures of what you're playing or talk about what you're playing or whatever. Um, it is a friendly space for all war gamers of all stripes. Um, let before we go uh, any further, let me say hello to the folks who are here. Let's start with six actual: Alexander Fontaine Rousseau, Andrew Frankie, Board Gaming Geezer, Brent McKay, Brian Gash, Chad Canetti, Cole Bieri, Dale Brady, Daniel Silverthorne, Daniel Teets, David Imperato, Ed Holtzman, Garrison Venn, Half Assed Gaming. Welcome, John Harold Buchanan is in the house. H-U-N-644. I'm not sure how you want me to say that. Please mention it in the chat if that's not it. ID Jester's in the house. Kirk, uh, glad, to, glad to see you here. Um, James Whitmer, Jason W., Jeff Beeler, Joe Okabayashi, Joe Perez, John Madison, John Stanley, uh, John Clark, Kevin Bertram, Manders. So we just, we just reset the whole thing. Gosh darn it. Mark McNair, Mark Daly, Meandering Mike, Matt Taylor, Mike Burnett, Mo Romaniak, Ray Garby, Ray Musselman. Stigler is in the house. Thomas Bandy, Tim Zales, Tom MC, William Aarons, and William Bird. That is who I picked up so far. So I appreciate it. Uh, for I appreciate all folks uh, for coming out today. Unboxing might happen on Thursday. We'll talk about that in, in the fullness of time. Um, toward the end of the show, we'll talk about what's coming up. I did not actually get a... Whoa, shit. I actually did not get an unboxing out last week because, you know, copious free time and all that. So let me give a uh, an individual shout out to the two new Swordsman level patrons. She joined at the Swordsman level this week. So thank you, Kyle Harris and Eric Anderson. Uh, and thank you to all ongoing patrons of Ardwolf Slayer. Your, uh, your assistance is much appreciated. We will try to get... Hey, uh, a page, another patrons only live stream going at some point. I was gonna about to say maybe January, but January is looking 
a little congested right now. So we'll see We'll see if we can do it. It's not a huge amount of overhead, but there's a lot going on. Um, so thank you, patrons. So um, let me... Oh, and if you, uh, if you haven't yet, please thumbs up the video. Please subscribe to the channel. We are real close to 6,000 subscribers, and I'd kind of like to hit it by the end of the year. So if you're not subscribed already, please subscribe. Uh, most of you probably are, but uh, lots of folks watch and aren't subscribed. So please do so. And, and it is much appreciated when you do. All right. So let's hop over to first. I guess I'll give you uh, CSR news. Um, as I, I think I mentioned last week, the votes are in. Um, we are the tabulation is done. We are in the awards show preparation phase. And just John C. Thank you so much. Um, just of course, as you know, the, the awards show preparation was, uh, you know, was starting to happen. Dan got COVID. So he's feeling a little rough, but I mean, I believe he will survive. John C from the sunny Philippines. Yeah. Uh, you know, you weren't in the, in the, in the list that YouTube provides to me. And I apologize for that. I apologize on YouTube's behalf. So it, thank you, John. It is much appreciated. Not so hot, 79 degrees. I would be delighted to have 79 degrees right now, I got to tell you. So, um, we are going to give a Paula Farrell asks if you are going, if we're going to cover Avalon Hill 2005. Uh, we are definitely not going to get to Avalon Hill, the, like the post Avalon Hill, Avalon Hill era in, in episodes, not tonight and not in episodes two or three either, because the, the, uh, the publication frequency with Avalon Hill, which is like one or two games a year for a long time, um, goes up starting in the in like the late seventies or early eighties. I think in 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 you know them trying to uh, to compete with uh, SPI in terms of output, which obviously didn't happen, uh, but they did start to put out more. So we're gonna have we're gonna cover a lot of games tonight that I'm not necessarily gonna have a ton to say about it because, like I said, we're literally cutting off tonight the year I was born. So, uh, but I, you know, nevertheless, I've got, as usual, I've got opinions. Uh, Bill Simone says, Ohio's going to have 79 this week. That'd be nice. I mean, 79, you, you add the temperatures from three or four days together, we might get 79. And the legendary fucko is in the house. So much appreciated. I've got something for him, which I will hand over whenever I get down there. Also, we have to talk about Buckeye Game Fest, which I will be talking about, um, I don't really want to tie it up this week because we have a lot to do. We have a GMT update we have to go through as well. Um, so let's let's hold off on Buckeye Game Fest. There is going to be a quite a, a strong presence of Labatai there that I can tell you. Um, so let's talk about. I have forgotten to set up the screen share. Um, so let's talk about the GMT update. Um, this is GMT's monthly update from a couple of days ago. So, uh, as usual, if you, uh, Alan Salazar, thank you very much. It is much appreciated. Um, as usual, if you want to like read the whole thing and all the little factoids and stuff like that, by all means, hop over to GMT's website. We are just going to hit the highlights here tonight. So, message from Gene Happy holidays. Um, bah, 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 yearly sale was successful. I have no doubt that that's the case. Away team is doing very well, which I believe will surprise no one. Um, commands and Colors reprints. So the Commands and Colors situation is that they have found uh, a sugar daddy again to help cover the printing costs of Commands and Colors, mostly Napoleonics, but maybe that includes the other stuff as well. The interesting piece here is that they're going to reprint, uh, you know, whatever they have on P500, and they've just added like five reprints to... Um, uh, to the P500 list, which they're going to send to the printer in March. Uh, but subsequent printings after that will start to combine the different modules into like omnibus packs to save on the cost of wood because they don't then they don't need duplicate blocks. They have already started doing this with Commands and Colors Ancients, um, which I have relatively little of. I mean, I have the core set and the the uh, the well the first omnibus expansion. Um, but uh, Commands Colors Napoleonics, which I like a lot, I have everything. So, and I've got everything else, everything else, uh, everything else. So, I mean, this, you know, supply chain situation is still having an effect. And the even though logistics costs are down, that doesn't necessarily translate to stuff that costs more to bring in when it was high, right? So, 
I am not about to second guess GMT on this, so we're not going to. Uh, but anyway, that's the news. This is, on, and they're raising the prices on all the commands and colors, Napoleonic stuff as well. Uh, they're also uh, raising the prices on Samurai Battles and Medieval, which are both coming back into print soonish. We should realistically see those in 2023, probably Q. My guess would be Q3, but that is completely a guess. All right, new art uh, map here for Twilight Struggle Red Sea, which I did not pre-order. Grand Prix Track Pack, which I did not pre-order. Uh, SD Histcon, we mentioned this last week. That is Harold Buchanan and crew um, have awarded their first annual Summit Award to Red Flag Over Paris, designer Fred Serval and company. Uh, developers Luke Billingsley, Joe Dewhurst, and Jason Carr, who created the solo system. And the artist, it, it, the game looks good. I have it. I haven't had a chance to play it yet. And I've already told the meat coma story where I tried to play it in a meat coma and it wasn't, uh, wasn't, it was not a successful effort. Um, so Chad Kennedy, thank you so much. Much appreciated. It really kind of does help right now. Um, after, you know, the, 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 per well, I mean, the, the holidays are strapping me with out of the personal budget and the, and the channel budget got wiped out. So, um, all right, GMT1 stuff, solo opponents for various games, including Red uh, Bell of Treason, Red Dust Rebellion, um, CDG Solo System Pack number two, and Vijaya Nagara, which I think I'm not mangling too badly. Um, here's a free printable CDG Solo System play sheet for Mark Herman's Empire of the Sun. So it also works with South Pacific Burma and Plan Orange as well. Um, so that is all cool um inferno this is coming pretty soon we'll talk about that there's some stuff there here's the map uh reasonably sure that's the final map at this point as usual for that series it looks really good here's new vassal modules including time for trumpets at any cost mets 1870 that's a herman lutman design uh it is the franco-prussian war module for uh the blind swords system um and i haven't looked at it because franco-prussian war is i i've got a couple of games on it but not really much so um I haven't really looked at that, but it's Blind Sword, so I imagine it plays well. Uh, Commands Colors Napoleonic Death Valley Battles for the Shenandoah, which I think I've done an unboxing of. I know I've filmed it. It's possible I am. The, the backlog of unboxing videos is absolutely off the hook right now. Um, Invasion Norway, um, and that's it for this month. Designer interviews with a whole bunch of different people. I didn't do any this week. Player's Aid got Fred, uh, who has a guest, guest, just, just, I don't know. Of Robin Hood, I think we, I think somebody already told me how that's supposed to be pronounced, and I have already forgot. Um, so GMT T-shirts, that's nice. Custom dice for Twilight Struggle. If you're a big Twilight Struggle fan and you bought like those Bakelite pieces um, to tra uh, track influence for Twilight Struggle, maybe you want these fancy dice as well. They're, not, I mean, they're not that fancy, but you know, they're thematically uh, appropriate. If you don't have thematically appropriate dice, all right. Uh, P500 uh, editions. Um, there's a bunch of reprints here, and there's two new things. So we'll talk about the two new things in a minute. Um, a Fading Star, Insurgency and Piracy in Somalia. That is going to be right here. This is a coin series game. Um, this actually, who's the designer? Uh, Jan de Villeneuve. Um, this actually looks pretty interesting. Um, very curious to see this. I haven't pushed the button on this yet, but the chances that I will push that button are pretty good. Um, as I've mentioned before, I like the coin system. I don't like it enough to just buy every single coin game, and I don't own every single coin game, nor have I played every single coin game. I bought and have played the ones that I am thematically interested in and, and just those. Um, this is an interesting topic. Um, the other uh, entry here is Imperial Eagles. This is a Down in Flames. I believe this was uh, forecasted in a previous update. Um, this is the Down in Flames uh, card game system in the Pacific. I have never played Down in Flames, so I am not sure exactly what this covers. But um, incidentally, the dates we're going by tonight are going to be the original release dates, just because that's how it was listed on BGG. So if, if, if 1971 will be the latest release date that we do, some of the dates that I will give you will be the original date, say, from 3M rather than Avalon Hill's edition of it, which might have been a little bit later. So if you like Down in Flames, and I know this thing gets played at Concert World Expo and elsewhere, um, or Wild Blue Yonder, which I believe is um, uh, in that series as well, uh, then you may want to give this a look. Let me close that. All right. 
Uh, a bunch of reprints, including Labyrinth uh, and a bunch of Commands and Colors Napoleonic stuff. New P500s, another theater-focused Twilight Struggle brand game like Twilight Struggle Red Sea, which I tentatively probably am not the market for. Um, a new multi-pack game, always happy to take a look at those. New CDG from Mark Herman, always happy to look at that. Uh, one to four player CDG from one of our coin game designers, but note they didn't say that it's a coin game, so maybe it isn't. Um, so that is potentially uh, potentially interesting. Yeah, I've got a lot of tabs open. This is how we prep for the show. So yeah, it has been a while since some. Well, I think Wild Blue Yonder is in that series though, and it it came out uh, not too long ago. I know it's well, it was available last I checked. Let me put it that way. All right. So uh, game more in Albany, Oregon. Cascade Con in uh, Bellingham, Washington. Looks interesting. Spring 2023, we again at the warehouse, which is in April. Love to go to one of those at some point, but it ain't happening anytime soon. And certainly not in 2023. Uh, here's a video with Matt Calkins. Uh, retail price increase on 18 India. Again, citing the cost of the wood. Builds a fire bulge campaign after action report. Stuka Joe, Joe style sequence of play cards for Skies Above Britain, which you can just download. Uh, retail price increase on Mr. President, which if you've seen the inside of Mr. President should surprise no one. Uh, it has a lot of stuff in it. Uh, Hitler's Reich uh, second edition printed rules. Here's a Volko video, the by Volko. Um, uh, introing Inferno. Counter trays back in stock. Get them while they last. A uh, bunch of other stuff. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Here's uh, some more Board Game Chronicle stuff. Uh, quite a lot of stuff. He's cranking out the stuff, actually. They're cranking out the content. Uh, next GMT multi pack. The next one that gets uh, put on P500 probably won't be a three pack of uh, Battles of the American Revolution, but the next one that comes out might be because that's already uh, on P500 Volume 2. Um, and it uh, has made its number, I believe, quite handily. But that said, we'll see where it is in the queue when we get to the bottom, which is what we're looking for right now. Not yet there, P500s. I will call your attention to Bear Trap. By the way, the real number nowadays is not 500. It's really more like 650 or 750. Um, they haven't really talked about that, but that, you know that's the way it is. Um, so Bear Trap looks pretty interesting. Borokin, the, the Tino Resistance, looks pretty good. Napoleon in Egypt looks pretty good. Um, otherwise, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff on here, depending on what you personally are interested in. Um, yeah, this ain't happening, though, because that's not something that GMT or Compass or whatever can just grab. It's going to be a, a, you know, a licensing thing with the Burroughs estate, which nowadays, which is very litigious, by the way. Uh, historically and which wants big money for that so um there is a rpg though from modifius and it's beautifully produced if you like the 2d20 system that they have and i think it's pretty good i think it's pretty well used in that i think it's not i think it's my third most interesting 2d20 game behind conan and star trek which they just conan they just lost the license from all right so more inside gmt stuff most most requested everybody knows you've all ordered all these already all right, current charges and shipments. They started shipping these a couple of days ago. Dominant Species Marine, second printing. Next War Poland, second edition. Next War Supplement, number three. And Twilight Struggle, Red Sea. I didn't order Next War Supplement, number three. I'm probably going to need it, and I'll probably buy it at Origins, would be my guess. Um, next charges on Wednesday, January 4th. Banish the Snakes. That's Kevin McPartland's game. Inferno, which I am on the hook for. And finally, 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 the Russian Campaign Deluxe 5th Edition, for those who've had that on order for eight years or however long it's been there, along with the mounted maps. So that is finally going to be hitting the end of the pipeline. Truly a festivist miracle, as Vince Reese says. Welcome, Vince, back to the stream. Um, all right. Uh, what else do we have? All right. We've just covered that stuff. At Sea is Battle of White Plains, which I have pre-ordered. Clash of Sovereigns, which I probably should pre-order. And Sekigahara fifth printing, which I don't really want to buy just as a as a budgeting matter, uh, but I would be happy to play Sekigahara at some point. Um, at the printer, but no ship date include whoops, 18 India, Ancient Civilizations of the Middle East. That's Mark McLaughlin's sequel to the Ancient Civilizations of the Middle Sea. Um, Atlantic Chase second printing, which I think lots of folks will jump on. That sold out quite quickly. Border Reavers Grand Prix new track pack. 
uh, Paths of Glory Deluxe Second Printing, Seas of Thunder, that's Jeff Horger's game, The British Way, which is the which is the coin quad, um, which I haven't ordered and I probably can be sold on. Um, and Last 100 Yards, Volume 1, Second Printing. Last 100 Yards is another one that I really ought to try and just haven't had the bandwidth to do that. Mr. President and People Power will be going to the printer in December. Uh, Mr. President's been on P500 for a long time. People Power has been on for less time. That's a coin game on insurgency in the Philippines. So all I know about that topic is it's very sunny there. Um, and then in final art and proofing, we're now just going to cover the ones that have changed. Panzer North Africa has moved up. Um, in the art department, Commands and Colors, uh, La Grande Battles, which is the, in the Commands and Colors Napoleonics expansion for Grand Battles, long awaited and much complained about by our good friend Jim Ozarski, um, he of, uh, of the Armchair Dragoons. Uh, but it is finally coming and it is in the art department. Um, and then nearing art department readiness. I didn't see anything on here. I have two mouses over here. Let's put this one where it goes so I don't grab it and look like an idiot. Uh, nothing else new here. So uh, content creators who have covered GMT games in the last month, that's basically everybody. So um, uh, this is a good place to get started, um, you know, looking at war game content on YouTube. I will mention that uh, obviously there are a number of outstanding content creators that do not make this list. Um, generally, that's because they have less frequent content, but, you know, less frequent, but better content uh, is, uh, you know, better, right? So Perfidious Albion asks about Serpent of the Seas reprint. I haven't heard anything about that, and I don't believe that it's on P500. Um, so let us get to our purview, re-preview, pre-rundown, whatever we're calling it, um, of Avalon Hill. Now, the first game, obviously, I actually had to go out of my way to find this because BGG lists it as the Avalon Game Company. And not the Avalon Hill game company, and you actually have to go to a separate listing to see it. And this is obviously accurate, uh, but I did have to, you know, make a note to, oh, they started with Tactics 2. That's weird. So this is the original commercial bo American board war game right here. Uh, uh, Perfidious Albion says Panzer North Africa probably won't be ready until summer, which... If by ready we mean submitted to GMT as as ready to go to the printer, that sounds about right given what the their the 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 lag in their production pipeline seems like right now. Okay, so this is you know this is the original right. This is the game that literally, if if any game can be said to have been the first commercial American war game, this is it. Um, I I think that. Gettysburg is probably the more influential game, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so I completely agree with this. In fact, uh, Perfidious Albion, I think I want to see an entire Fine Colors module on the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Um, I think you could easily get uh, cool stuff out of that. And remember, the Dutch were tangling with the Spanish in that period as well. So you, if you needed more naval engagements, you could always hop into that action. <clears throat> particularly noteworthy is Admiral, Dutch Admiral Van Rien's seizure of the Spanish treasure fleet, um, which, you know, just, just saying it like that sounds pretty awesome. Uh, John C. helped with people power with proofing of cards and historical backgrounds. That's awesome, John. Uh, people power is another one that I haven't pre-ordered, um, but that I, I'm kind of interested in learning more about that historical event. And so I might actually at least play it, if not buy it. Um, so at this point, uh, is tactics like worth running down? Tactics one, right? Is it worth running down? So this is uh, for, for like historical interest, maybe uh, because this is the forerunner to a lot of what we do, right? A lot of the you know the mechanical structures that war games lean on even now um, came out of tactics. Um, which in turn, you know, lent, leaned on on the miniatures uh, activities of the time as well. That said, uh, it isn't a historical game. There, it's just like two fictional nations fighting over fictional terrain on a square grid. And mechanically, I think we'd have to say that it's a fairly clumsy effort. Um, which is, you know, why four years later, Avalon Hill, Charles Roberts would do Tactics Two, which 
I'm not sure is going to, I'm not sure I'm going to say anything different about Tactics 2. Let me put it that way. Um, you will notice that there are zero copies available on the board game geek market. Noble Knight wants 150 bucks for one. We're not going to hop over to their site to take a look. I'll tell you about the Noble Knight, my current Noble Knight situation, which is not a union situation. It's a customer service situation uh, and does not reflect badly on the Noble Knight customer service. But the story's not over yet, so I can't tell the story. Maybe maybe next week. Uh, next up is Tactics 2 from 1958. Again, Charles Roberts. Uh, I think it's got a sort of better laid out box cover. Uh, but it's the same type of thing, right? It's got, you know, the, the very er early and quite ugly uh, pink and baby blue counters. Um, it's on a square grid. It is, uh, you know, two fictional nations with with infantry, uh, armor, and artillery um, fighting it out. It is a mechanically less influential game than tactics. If you really like tactics, maybe you want to run this out, run this down. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you can get copies of Tactics 2 pretty inexpensively. Remember, this thing was in print for like 30 years, okay? So if copies are not incredibly uh, expensive, don't be shocked. Um, and they're not, but these, cop these copies are all in reasonably bad-looking shape, too. Um, so Tactics, Tactics 2, eh, you know for like interest of in the evolution of mechanics inside the hobby, maybe these are interesting, but I mean, if I had them, I wouldn't play them uh, quite frankly. Um, that's not going to be true of all the Charles Roberts designs, but it is true of these two. Um, next up is the one that I think is probably worth a look um, in terms of um, being the first commercial historical war game based on an actual historical situation in the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, this went through a lot of different versions with Avalon Hill. Um, Charlie himself admitted that the thing was not, none of this stuff early on was playtested at all. Um, now, I will actually agree with this, um, that at the time, Tactics, Tactics 2 were good starter games because they're not complicated, right? They're easy to play. The problem for me with those two games is that they're not historical situations, and therefore that really sucks all the, all the, the interest out of it for me. Um, it's the same reason why I didn't take a shine to Columbia's original Victory product, um, which, again, was like World War II but fought on a fictional map between idealized, uh, uh, you know, World War II powers um, and it wasn't interesting uh, for me for that reason. And then when they went and did that in an, like on an actual map, it became considerably more interesting. Um, uh, I would all, I, let me mention that I would be happy to order a, a reprint of Surface of the Seas. It's the one I don't have. So in, in the series. Uh, oh, the, Gettysburg was a lot of people's first war game, but it wasn't necessarily this version of Gettysburg, right? So this is Gettysburg 58. They did another version in the 60s. Um, there's a whole bunch of, do they list those individually here on BGG? Looks like they don't. So this one, we're going to have to take a look at the version history of, because this was all over the place. And every time they like redid it, um, you'd see like somewhat different mechanics, right? They would revisit the mechanics. Um, so, uh, what do we got here? So first edition, this is probably the square Gettysburg. Second edition from 61 might be the Hex Gettysburg, but that might also be 64 too. So it went uh, from a square grid to a hex grid and then back to a square grid. And then after a couple of total redesigns in the, starting in the 70s, um, they, uh, they kept it on a square grid. Um, I would be curious, I'm not running this thing down as a, as a collector's piece, but uh, I'd be curious to play this. Um, it... it, it Again, you know, strictly for a historical interest, not of the, the actual history history, but of the history of the hobby. I think Gettysburg is a is a landmark game in the history of the hobby. Um, you can see that the copies on BGG tend to be fairly beat up, which is not at all surprising. Another thing is that these Avalon Hill flat boxes, really anybody's flat boxes, but a lot of people had Avalon Hill flat boxes, um, tended to wear poorly. Um, because they're a weird size, you really have to store them flat. And then if you put something that's smaller than them on, on top of them, um, you will get, um, you will get dishing and possibly blown corners. 
And then there were some of them like uh, wooden ships and iron men, which is really full when you put it all together and you, t- you know, sort the counters out and stuff, which I mean, you're not getting counter trays in these things. Um, and then um, something like flat top, which we're not going to get to today, unfortunately, even though it's probably at this time today, my favorite Avalon Hill game. Um, uh, you could not, there's there just no way to get all that stuff back in that box. So it's relatively uncommon to see copies of flat top unless they're shrink wrapped, um, that aren't, that don't have blown corners. Mine has blown corners or had blown corners until I repaired them. Um, next up is, so, so there's an, uh, Avalon Hill in the early years was not strictly a historical military board game company, right? They were, their, their shtick was, Board games for thinking for people who want to think or something to that effect, and a lot. And Charlie Roberts was huge into trains. So one of the things that we got here is Dispatcher from 1958, very early Avalon Hill. It's got these sort of tri- very uh, sort of Avalon Hill looking cover here. Um, although I have like no real interest in. Um, this game or really in train games in general i you know there's like a historian of train games out there i'd love to have a conversation with them you know maybe we'd get a show out of this and maybe we wouldn't about how influential this early avalon hill train game is to the current train game landscape there will be stuff that i skip but mostly it's not games um and there will be also stuff that i don't have much to say about Like Verdict, a law game where you are lawyers. One of the original set of Avalon Hills adult games which include Gettysburg Tactics to U-Boat and Dispatcher. Um, Not very many copies of this floating around. Uh, Probably somewhere. No, you are a courtroom lawyer in this realistic, authentic legal game by Avalon Hill, a Quinn Martin production. Um, But uh, not, not something I'm terribly interested in, but it's got a lot of interesting looking doodads in it like this wheel and solution wheel and stuff like that that's kind of neat doug senseth uh mentions uh chris marquardt who used to run the train gamers association that's a good call um i just don't really know any of those those folks i mean i know folks that are into rail games uh, but i'm not enough into rail games even though i'll occasionally play one uh to know that uh, to know like who's who in that space right other than the you know, the friends of mine that play um, train games. Uh, Flat, this is the, this is correct. As Perfidian Albi, Perfidious Albion mentions, Flat Top is basically, there is basically zero air in that box when it is shrink wrapped. And it is challenging to, to un- take the shrink wrap off, take all the stuff back in the, out of the box, and then put it all back in the box without punching it and make the box close. So, uh, that box is packed airtight, and it's 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 just impossible. It really should have been in the longest days type type of box. It's it's got a lot of pieces. It's got you know two big boards, mounted boards. Um, it's got pads and all kinds of other stuff. Great game, but man, you ain't getting it back in the box. Um, U boat, the original U boat, nineteen fifty nine. This is Charles S. Roberts. This is another one that I think is is probably still worth a bit of a peek. Um, it's one of the early ones. It's pretty abstract. I, I believe the rules, obviously I've never played this. I believe the rules to be fairly simple. Um, and this again was in print for a long time. And there are a few copies floating around on, on the geek marketplace, uh, that are fairly beat up. I mean, in 1959, right? It's 60, Jesus Christ. It's 60 years old at this point, 60 plus years old. So not, not that, uh, any individual copy is necessarily that old. I mean, they were they kept this thing in print until at least the seventies, but um, and I know that from the catalogs uh, from the era, and I, I want to say even the eighties. Um, this is a kind of an interesting game. I mean, it's again, it's on a square grid because that's how board games were done back in the day. You get these weird little templates, which I don't know what those are for, and little tiny ship miniatures. Um, this is the early one with the metal pieces, for example. So this is probably neat. Um, is it worth running down? Eh, I, mean, I wouldn't say so, but you know, you see it at a flea market for five bucks or something like that. Maybe, you, maybe you grab it um, just just to give it a look. You know what I'm saying? Next up is football strategy. 
You'll recall that um, Avalon Hill had an extensive line of sports games. This was designed by Tom Shaw. This still gets played. Um, I have heard of people still playing this and still making cards for this thing. How popular that is, I have no idea. And you'll notice that these, here's a tube edition from 1959 in for 30 bucks in what this person says is like new condition. So, um, Fiddy Salbian says the SPI soap boxes were very generous with storage room by virtue of box size. Yes, that's true. Those are, I mean, obviously those are all big games, but even war in Europe, you can get, you can get four counter trays in that box with no trouble. Uh, maybe even five, and you can easily get that game in four or five counter trays. Um, and that was, might have been the biggest one in terms of number of pieces. Certainly War in the Pacific is comparable. Um, I never played football strategy, but we will get to one of the sports games that I did play shortly. Uh, next up, of course, is the classic uh, Diplomacy. This is uh, was originally published by, I don't know who, but uh, it was originally, uh, now I got to find out. Hold on. Originally published by Waddington's, I think. Um, and of course, this is a classic. This is not a game I personally favor. Um, understand that the mechanics to diplomacy are really simple, but really rigid. And there's really nothing to it from in terms of learning the rules. Diplomacy is, as the name suggests, a game about negotiation, right? You are, it is all about your ability to negotiate with the other humans sitting at that table. Um, and there will almost certainly, you'll have a, a fairly boring game of diplomacy if there's no backstabbing. Chances are good they'll be backstabbing. And as Drew Detterer says, how to lose six friends in three hours is a basically um, accurate assessment of diplomacy. Or see a table flipped in live action. That is possible. Um, I can think of no Avalon Hill games more likely to get a table flipped than diplomacy. There's, there's some other ones, uh, but we're not going to get to them today. Republic of Rome is one, for example. Uh, and this has been through a million editions. Um, there's a channel on YouTube. Is it Legendary Tactics? Maybe it is. Uh, that did that did like putting together the ultimate diplomacy edition with like the ni the nicest pieces and the nicest board from all the different editions and stuff like that. And I actually did that for Risk. And then I haven't played Risk in 25 years, but um, at least the regular Risk. Uh, but you know, this is a classic. It's not It's not on my personal list of things I enjoy playing. Um, you can easily get a copy of this for $20 if you just be patient, right? Noble Knight's selling one for $9. God knows what kind of shape that's in, but um, don't pay a lot for a copy of Diplomacy. I do think it's one of those things that, like doing a Kriegspiel, that every wargamer should do at least once. Um I think it is a it will be a good learning experience. It is best done at a convention with people you do not know and are not friends with. I'm just saying. Um, I mean, that's a little bit of an the the, the whole canard about you're going to lose friends over diplomacy is is a bit of an exaggeration. But at the same time, uh, you know, people get hot about it, right? So let's fix that first of all. All right, another of the classic Avalon Hill boardroom series, um, Management, a very evocatively named. This is Charlie Roberts' design from 1960, classic-looking Avalon Hill box. It looks super management-y. Um, if there are modern games that look like maybe they could be spreadsheets, this would be an older game that looks like maybe this predates spreadsheets, uh, but looks quite spreadsheety. I don't know that it plays that way. I have never spoken to any human who has played this. So, um, and you can get copies relatively, again, relatively inexpensively on Board Game Geek. Um, this is the kind of thing I would probably be inclined to look for at flea markets and thrift stores and stuff like that. Uh, that's basically the only scenario in which I would find myself in possession of a copy of management. Um, checking in on that. Yep, everything is normal. All right, baseball strategy following up on uh, football strategy. I've never played this either. Don Greenwood and Tom Shaw from 1960. Uh, again, there's still people playing baseball football strategy and still doing updated cards and stuff for them. 
Um, I'm guessing that if you're really into the sport, which I was at one point and I'm not anymore um, for reasons I'm not going to go into here, but uh, this is, was part of the Sports Illustrated series, by the way, I will mention. Um, uh, checking out Jeff Beeler's comment here. Uh, Alan Kelhammer is the uh, designer of diplomacy and he's had 500 sets manufactured at his own expense after major companies have rejected the game. Um, and then it went to Games Research in 1960. Not Games Research and Design. Those were the Europe people. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, baseball strategy. Don't have much to say about it. People still like it. I can tell you that. Um, again, not a, not ruinously expensive by any means. Verdict 2. So not only could you play Verdict 1, but you could play Verdict 2 as well. And it looks like this is a revised version of Verdict rather than a new game on a related topic. Um, if, you know, somebody was really that interested in playing a courtroom drama game, um, you know, this is probably the one to get, I guess. I don't know if one would prefer to get this over the original or not. Um, this is not my field right here, but still Charlie Roberts designer. Um, new chess. I, I want to say that's the intended pronunciation. This is essentially a fancified chess variant, um, on a hex grid. Um, here is somebody's, this looks like somebody's board that they made rather than the original. Uh, we don't even have a lot of pictures of this. Uh, maybe that is the actual board. Here's an actual picture of the actual components, um, with, you know, hexes and little plastic pieces and all that other stuff. Um, we're going to cover a couple of different chess variants that were released from Avalon Hill at some point or another. I'm not sure how many we're going to get to tonight. Um, this is one of them. If you are into chess and want to try a hexagonal chess, yeah, I'd probably be into this. Uh, but I'm not into chess. I aggressively dislike chess. And it, it's just there's no there's no meat on its bones, right? Um, chess people will be outraged that I said that. But there's like... There's like no context to chess. And that's actually what I mean. There's like no, ah, this is Battle of the Bulls, you know, blah, 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 blah. We're not, you know, you're, it doesn't have any flavor. It's it's just abstract. It, it is it is basically a math problem. And that is why I'm not super into it. Um, other people could say that about OCS too, though. So, you know, takes all kinds. Uh, a new chess. Le Mans, a racing game. Rodney Mudge, Scott Wright design from 1961. This is a racing game. This is, uh, the description here says it's the great grandfather of uh, today's racing game. And that's probably true. Racing game, the racing mechanic is a mechanic that's been around for a long time. It predates this. So in this case, though, I think the, the key intuitive step that was made here was and maybe buy other games before this. I have no idea. I'm not into racing games either. Um, was to say, hey, we have this race mechanic. Let's like make a game about an actual like car race or you know marathon or whatever. Um, so some of the one of these early race mechanic games actually did that. Next up, now this one I can actually talk about. D Day, Charles S. Roberts design, uh, 1961. Um, like a lot of games in this era, it's set the. It, you know, it says D-Day, uh, but it covers a lot more than D-Day. And we'll take a look at the map here. Um, and you're going to see that the map covers the basically the entire Western theater of World War II. Um, there we go. This is apparently the best map shot we've got. Um, yeah, so this this basically covers the, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, of the, like, Avalon Hill games from the 60s, many of which I think don't hold up well today except as curiosities. I think this one is more interesting today than average um, in that respect. And, you know, all, I'm not talking about any courtroom games or whatever. Um, I'm talking about board games, right? This game actually looks a little bit interesting. Now, you know, it's very stock for, for Avalon Hill at the time, so we have to we have to recognize that, but at the same time, this is an important game, right? I think it's the first game on its topic. Um, it's got, you know, relatively straightforward rules. Um, nobody's going to get super confused playing this thing. 
this is where we start to get in. Here's a like new copy for 45 bucks. Unpunched box in great shape. Contents is new. Box in great shape doesn't doesn't mean like new to me. Uh, but bo box in great shape for 45 bucks for the unpunched D-Day. Eh. I mean, again, this was in print for a long time, too. So whoever's selling that copy, that copy wasn't necessarily printed in 1961, right? Um, and if we look at the versions, we're going to see that there's there's a there's a second edition. I have no idea what the uh, the differences between the first and second edition would be. War game art what remained plain until the 80s, I think. Um, even uh, SPI, I mean, you could even call SPI's maps plain, even when, as they often were, graphically well designed. Civil War. Uh, this is a Charles Roberts uh, design, and it is played with these pawns on a hex grid, a uh, very, you know, very high scale hex grid of, you know, the eastern half of the United States. Um, to me, this is not of interest. Uh, this is clearly a very abstract game. Um, you can get it reasonably inexpensively. I think maybe not. This guy wants a 50 bucks for a good condition copy. I wouldn't pay 50 bucks for this in the shrink wrap personally, but um, I, I don't think this is a worthwhile game nowadays. I don't think this is one that holds up particularly well. Uh, the counter colors back in, back in the day for Avalon Hill are, let's say not great. Um, choice. The fun multiplies with a half dozen or more family games in a single package. Uh, this is something I've never seen. I don't recall it from any of the catalogs. Um, I obviously don't know anything about it, but it's got some fancy-ish pieces with little pegs and spinners and shit like that. Um, and it's six party games in a package by Hans Goldschmidt. Once again, 1961. Here's an interesting one, Chancellorsville. Now this, uh, there's a second edition, a first edition and a second edition of this. And I don't, think that Avalon Hill lists or that no no it was uh let's actually take a look at that in a minute okay so this is the original Chancellorsville um every, but everything that I know about this game is from the fact that Gilbert Collins did a video on it so if you're really interested in this particular battle or this particular game check this out um let's say it was not as well received as Gettysburg and I think it is not um as interesting today as get as any edition of Avalon Hill's Gettysburg um that said, it's and and you can if we look at the pieces, you're going to see you know once again that crazy Avalon Hill uh, pink. But at least some printings of this had those super thick uh, battle line style counters too. So you know there's that. Uh, and this is a Charles Roberts design, not uh, not a thing that unless you're there's enough games about Chancellorsville that I don't think anybody needs to run this down, including some fairly simple ones. This is fairly simple. Um, and the map is, I mean, it's 1961, so I, I guess this map is okay for 1961, right? Um, now, this was redone, and this is the, the new version by Randall Reed, and it is my understanding that this is a completely different game. Um, it was, however, also not incredibly well received and is not really thought of particularly highly today. Nobody seems to be talking about this game. I don't recall whether uh, Gilbert's video, and I'm sure he mentioned this in the video, it's just been a while. Um, I don't remember whether Gilbert's video was about the or original edition of Chancellorsville or the second edition of Chancellorsville. Uh, but you can see that, it, you know, the counters are at least not that horrific pink anymore. They're actually kind of a light gray instead. Um, now, Randall Reed is an interesting designer uh, because he's the guy that did The Longest Day in Starship Troopers and a bunch of other fairly noteworthy stuff from Avalon Hill. And many of those are are, are very good, good to very good games, actually. Panzer Leader. I mean... Panzer Leader's based on the Dunnigan Panzer Blitz system, right? So there's not a lot of like mechanical steps forward in Panzer Leader, but um, you know, still design credit. And some of these are new, though, right? Uh, uh, and Air Israeli Wars is the same way; it's a derivative of the Panzer Panzer Blitz system. But the Longest Day is its own thing. Starship Troopers is its own thing. 1776 is kind of based on. I'd have to look at the chronology on this to be honest. Rookie's War that's kind of its own thing too. So. 
Uh, but second edition of Chancellorsville, and this was 1974, so it's technically out of our range today, but because it's the follow-up to this, I think we're, we're talking about it now. Air Empire by Tom Shaw. This is, uh, you know, this is not a, a, another one of those things that's like not really in my thing, right? Uh, and there was, it. there's been sort of a, a number of these sort of air industrial games that I'll call them. And I had one or two of them as a kid and thought they were fairly interesting. 1776 is quite a good game, by the way. Um, I don't know if this is interesting or not. Um, Tom Shaw is a really important figure in the history of Avalon Hill and, and therefore in the history of the hobby. That said, um, I don't know if he holds up particularly well as a designer. Uh, and a lot of these are not his designs. Like Origins of World War II is, is a Jim Dunnigan design. We'll talk about that today. Um, I don't know how, how well a lot of these hold up. Bold 65 we'll get to. Uh, Waterloo, Lindsay Schultz and Tom Shaw. So this was a very popular game at the time. And it's another one of those things that I, I think probably isn't worth anybody's time today. Uh, but it was extremely popular. One designer... Uh, that this game had an enormous influence on and who played it like to an insane degree was Gary Gygax. Also true of Gettysburg, by the way. Uh, he played l played this till it literally fell apart. Um, so super abstract. It is on a hex grid, not very attractive, uh, you know, and, and quite primitive by today's standards. Um, I wouldn't say this has a zero interest level, but I, I for me, it's pretty low. Um, you can see that the prices are a little higher on this one, though, so it's a little more highly sought after, and that should tell you something. Twixt. Uh, this is an abstract strategy game um, where you build these little rail networks. It looks kind of like... Um, uh, uh, what was that video game? Shit. Um, Kicks. I think was the name of the video game. It kind of looks like that. Um, and this is an Alex Randolph design. That's a name I'm not particularly familiar with. Um, so if you're into abstract strategy games, this might be an interesting one, uh, but I'm not. So with rare exceptions, but I'm generally not. Uh, Owari. This is a... Uh, so this is a like one of those pit and pebble type games. It's It's based on a large number of historical games that are basically variations on this, where you move, you have little stones or whatever, and a series of holes that you put the stones in and you move the stones from hole to hole um, to uh, get various objectives. Um, that's a whole, really a genre of games that stretches back millennia. And I have no interest in them whatsoever. <laughs> so I can't tell you very much. Uh, this was, as um, Ed Holtzman points out in the chat, um, this is one that originated with, is that up? There we go. Uh, this is one that originated with 3M. So when you think about 3M games, you th the first thing you probably think of, 3M, the people that make the tape? Yes, the people that make the tape at one point had a historical, not historical, but had a line of family board games that they eventually sold off to Avalon Hill. Pit and Caboodle, right? And, and therefore, uh, most or all of them eventually showed up um, as Avalon Hill games. There are a couple of exceptions. Jotty is one. I'm not absolutely sure Jotty ever made it out of the prototype stage, but there you go. Um, but Owari is the first one that we're getting to here. Jay-Z, Roll and Move Economic Game of Early TV Advertising Accounts and Advisory Fees. Designer Robert Goodman Agency. So, holy grails. Um, game created by WJZ TV Channel 13 in Baltimore. Copyrighted by the Robert Goodman Agency. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so this was something that was produced by a local television station in Baltimore and somehow out, it's somehow listed with Avalon Hill, uh, because there's an Avalon Hill logo on it. So apparently this is rare, a rare collectible. Um, but we are, uh, so of the three M games that came through, and I think we'll get to it, uh, that came through, uh, Avalon Hill down to today, 
I believe the only one that's still around in print or recently in print is Acquire. And it's a pretty good game, actually. Um, Bismarck, this is another pr a pretty interesting one. This is a Charlie Roberts and Tom Shaw design from 62. I forget exactly when Charles Roberts lost control of the company, but it's not long after this. Um, this is a pretty interesting game. Um, it may not be as fun as it could be if it were designed today. And we're, we're seeing a lot of things in this space. The Bismarck game from VUCA Simulations, for example, or Atlantic Chase or stuff like that. We're seeing a lot of development in this type of naval search mechanic right now. Um, and that's not a brand new phenomenon, but it's gonna it's making a splash in the last couple of years, mostly because of the Atlantic Chase and the Buka game and some other stuff. Um, I'd like to like to check this one out. This is one of the rare uh, Avalon Hill games from the '60s that I think is probably still pretty interesting today. Now, exactly who the designer is on this, I don't know because I've never owned this. BGG list: Charles Roberts and Tom Shaw. I don't know if that's the end of the story. It might not be. Um, it could be that Charlie Roberts started it and Tom Shaw finished it or something. I don't know. Um, deep in the soaking off era. Not quite. We're going to get there uh, before too much longer. Uh, thank you, Jeff Beeler. Much appreciated, though. Ploy. I remember this. I don't remember who the publisher was. Um, but uh, I, well, Old Lady Plays, thanks for coming by, by the way. Um, I, I remember Ploy, but I never played it. Uh, but I mean, there's there's been a whole universe of chess variants for at least many decades, well predating the uh, the advent of historical commercial American board games. Um, Bismarck's one that I think holds some interest nowadays, um, and you know that's probably why this very good copy is going for fifty bucks as opposed to not fifty bucks, which is the case in in here. We're going to get into some interesting educational games now, which I am going to deal with in a whirlwind fashion. The first of which is Word Power from Tom Shaw, 1963. This is moving around a circular board in an attempt to publish 10 books or obtain $100,000. I got to tell you, it looks somewhat Monopoly-like, but from that one sentence description, this has gone up about 400% in, in how, how interesting it might be. Um, am I going to run this down? No, I'm really not. So, uh, But in, in any case, it, it is a... As a as a game about publishing, that actually sounds kind of kind of interesting. It does look monopoly like though, and uh, you know, know who's into that. Uh, what time is it? Tom Shaw children's game from Avalon Hill preschool children's game with four games. Imagination. What time is it? Dollhouse and trucks, trains, boats, and planes, which flopped. Okay. Uh, Roberts gave up and planned to file bankruptcy on December 13th, 1963. Interesting. Okay, so we have that timeline nailed down. And of course, it's not like I haven't been immersed in this particular piece of data set for a while, but I didn't have the date in, in my head. So, and here's another one. Trucks, trains, boats, and planes. Um, it's an attractive and childish looking box. Um, no opinion on these. Pursuit type games similar to Candyland, which I think you will probably see from the board. Uh, these did not go over well. I'm guessing that they are fairly highly collectible, though, as as are a couple of the other things that we'll see here. <coughs> Stalingrad, 1963. I have said before that I think this is a uh, it's an, it's another one of those Avalon Hill games where it's called Stalingrad, but it's really about most of the East Front, um, and I'm not really in fact it really covers the entire East Front. So why why call it Stalingrad? I don't know. It's got very little. There's Stalingrad is a hex on the map. That's it. Um, out of I don't know a thousand hexes. So uh, yes. So we don't think we're going to get to outdoor survival today. I believe that's the early seventies. Um, but yes, the original box, the white box, gray box, uh, brown box, whatever. First printings of D and D actually told people. Hey, if you want rules for going around outside in the wilderness, go buy Avalon Hill's uh, Outdoor Survival. Um, that is one of Avalon Hill's top selling games for that reason. So Stalingrad here is very abstract. And consensus seems to be that it's fairly broken. There is some video on it. I don't recall who did that video. It wasn't Gilbert Collins, I can tell you that. because Gilbert is not uh, super into World War II. Um, I mean, not a terrible looking map for its era, really, but it's it's very abstract. And if you 
if you want a game like this of a reasonably similar complexity level, go get Russian campaign. Russian campaign's better. Um, next up, Imagination, another one of the kids' games. Um, no copies for sale. Be curious to know what, uh, well, let's look at price history. No price history for this. So these appear to be rarities. So there's that. And here's high bid. Uh, represent players are collectors attempting to gather sets of valuable properties and artifacts. That's interesting. That's a game mechanic that is very popular now in, you know, amongst the, the non-war game crowd. Um, for those who are into this kind of thing, I wonder if this is an interesting game for them. It's not really... Uh, um, are we having McFud puckers having uh, buffering problems? I'm not really seeing a problem here. I'm seeing stream health is good. Stream health seems to be good. Stream health is excellent. In fact, according to YouTube, so the problem might be on your end. Uh, fucko's got buffering too, but he's probably watching on that Obama phone. So, uh, that might be why. Dollhouse game. Uh, again, I'm curious to know how collectible these are. No price history on these things. Um, and Tom Shaw kids game. I have nothing to say about this other than that. It seems to be a rarity. Other folks, we'll talk about this in a second because we got, we are going to talk about that stocks and bonds. This is one that was around for a while. And this is one from 3M that migrated to, um, Avalon Hill. Uh, BGG doesn't know who the designer is and neither do I, um, several different versions available. External boxes look the same. Um, we have some descriptions of that. There's paper money that actually there's paper, pretty cool looking paper money. Actually, they're like little stock certificates in different corporations. Um, this is probably one of the ones that I'm, I'm not going to go run this down. I, I wouldn't pay $10 for this, but, um, I'd be curious to play this, something like this. Um, I kind of like economic games and, uh, they're not a main interest, right? And I have a couple. I've got 4X from Amabel Highland, for example, which is a pretty interesting look a game about currency trading. Um, this looks, you know, also interesting. Wonder who the designer was. Uh, Midway, this is this is a classic. This is a seminal game. Um, this is this with Bismarck, I think are early 60s Avalon Hill games that are probably worth a look today. He's getting mad at me for calling his phone an Obama phone. We've been milking this joke for years now, by the way. Um, he's like, um, Larry Pinsky, Lindsay Schultz on this. This is one that's, that's I think, still reasonably interesting. Um, I think it's, I, I think, again, there's a lot of movement in this space right now. Um, we're seeing a lot of new designers and or think outside the box type designers who are attacking these types of problems with new mechanics and a lot of folks may find their approaches more interesting than this 19, 1964 avalon hill approach uh but nevertheless i'm kind of I, I mean this is one of the predecessors to something like flat top right um which is a game that i love and think is fantastic um and i am happy to play atlantic chase because it's cool um and it's very well done but i also like flat top a lot so so this it, i don't actually think this is as good as flat top lest anyone uh hear that that's not what i'm saying uh but i think it's it's of interest right it's one of the ones uh from the period that i think folks might still uh, get some in, in, some information and enjoyment out of facts in five this is a trivia game i have seen this i believe i have looked through this there's a 2007 update interesting okay um and i think it's not like an answer the questions type trivia game i think you're given like a category and you have to like fill in a grid or something like that um i don't um i don't favor that i'd rather just have trivia questions but uh, we'll talk about that in a future show um africa core 1964 so this is another classic very important game very influential game also, I, I think by today's standards, not a particularly fun game to play. Um, this is the the source of the joke that it all comes down to one, uh, one to one attack roll outside to a brook. Um, that joke is because of Africa Core, and that is kind of how Africa Core and how you know not just Africa Core, 
but but how a lot of Africa, North Africa, or Operation Crusader, or um, you know, Western Desert campaigns end up uh, coming down to that one die roll. I mean, hell, our war in the desert came down to that. That part of the campaign came down to that one die roll. So, um, and in fact, the whole game came down to one different die roll. Um, so it, this is an important game, however, and this this is interesting enough that I wouldn't say that if you have a copy, you should just throw it in the garbage and not play it. Try it. Give it a shot. Play it. Um, and then move on to something else. Uh, there's plenty of other games in this space. Um, there's there's uh, the new edition of the African Campaign from Compass, which is very much an attempt to do Af Africa Core right. We've covered North Africa on our North Africa episode, so go check that out if you want to hear that in detail. Um, Acquire, um, with the really horrific, I mean, this is a thematically appropriate co cover, uh, but it's probably the ugliest cover. This is the 2016 Hasbro edition. Um, and this is like a game, I, I struggle to describe this because I played it once, it was like 25 years ago. Um, but I mean, thematically, you're building hotels and, and in, in practice, you're like laying these tiles down on this board. Um, this is a plastic board. Even the ancient Avalon Hill and 3M versions have a plastic board, which was just which has warped horrifically. Um, I actually picked one of these up at a thrift store a few years ago, and to my surprise, it was complete. Um, if you like economic economic games without heavy mechanics um, or heavy theme, um, you might well like Acquire. Uh, why? This is going for a hundred dollars. I don't know. You'd have to talk to that person. German bookcase edition that for 15 euros. Um, so this is a classic. I think this game still holds up extremely well as a not quite abstract strategy game, but as a thinly themed, mechanically light game. Okay. YouTube keeps giving me this pop-up that telling that telling me now would be a good time to put ads in. No, no, it wouldn't. Um, next is Squander by Commander Walter Whitney, game that allows you to live like a millionaire. Start with a million squander bucks and buy a bunch of stuff. First player to squander his million wins the game. Okay, so that's cute. It's the Brewster's Millions game, basically, and it again looks like Monopoly. Um, so I don't, you know, if you're into this, great. I have no, I have nothing to say about this. Uh, Blitzkrieg, this is yet another, so this is this is kind of not really but kind of tactics 3 okay um this is another generic um world war 2 feeling um a historical fantasy scenario between two abstract powers the pink and the blue um as such i mean a lot of people started with with this or with tactics or tactics 2 or whatever and yeah you, you know, you got to start somewhere, right? Uh, but I, I believe this game to have absolutely zero interest at this time. Um, I think it is mechanically primitive. Um, everything it accomplishes mechanically can be done better, cleaner, and faster. And there is no historical interest because there's no history in the game. It's of a, just a made-up situation on a made-up fantasy land continent. Um, so I, to me, this is not interesting at all. Um, other people's opinions may differ. Um, here's one that is, I think, still interesting. And and of the Avalon Hill games that start to end in this period, um, I think this is the one that holds up the best. Uh, this is bald, what we call bald, Battle of the Bulge, but we call it Bulge 65 because this too like Gettysburg was redone there were there were multiple editions and some of the editions were basically redesigns um even the 65 version of this while it's not great looking it's you know it is 1965 after all um this is i think still a fairly interesting game and boy i'd love to know how the terrain analysis went to have arrived at these conclusions but <laughs> Uh, if you look at a modern bulge, I mean, and bear in mind, I'm currently playing two different bulge games. Um, not be on purpose, it's just kind of the way it worked out. We're we're playing our practice game of Vok Dem Rhine, the Goss Vok Dem Rhine, uh, and we're also playing Last Bliss Creek, which I am, by the way, super, super grooving on. Uh, BCS in general 
um, more so than Last Blitzkrieg specifically, but Last Blitzkrieg is great too. Um, so I think this holds up pretty well. I think this is worth a look. Um, this is one I probably wouldn't buy unless I found a really nice condition copy for a really inexpensive price. Um, and that's unlikely. A VG copy here goes for 30 bucks, which I guess isn't that bad. Uh, this guy says it's complete. Box has moderate wear, repaired corners. Not surprising. Shipping is going to be a pain on these flat boxes. The pack, the, the 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 flat boxes don't, as I mentioned before in this show. And here's the recolored. Oh, this is this is fun. Somebody did an SPI uh, recolored counters. They redid the counters in an effort to make them look a little more like SPI counters. And looks like they did a nice job too. John Edwards. John Edwards. Okay, uh, I shouldn't have been surprised about that. Um, half inch replacement stickers. That's intriguing. Okay. Who needs that? Uh, but it looks like a bunch of people have done, look at this. Jeez. This, this person fancied these up quite a lot. I'm not sure this much stuff on the counter. I'm not really sure that's gaining you anything, but the, but these are pretty, right? Cause this is a simple game, right? These are not complicated games. Um, Win, place, and show. Horse racing. No opinion. Thomas M. Divill, John B. Riley, 1966. I remember this game in the catalog. I've never seen it. I've never spoken to anybody who's ever played it. Obviously, it is 33 copies for sale on BGG. Holy cow. Um, including, uh, what's the best condition? Can you sort these, by the way? I don't see how you can do that. Um, be curious to see, here's a new condition copies, but they're all in Germany for some reason. And they're probably the German edition. Here's a VG 3M copy for 25 bucks. Um, really just curious about that. No interest in win, place, and show at all. I didn't leave out the war games. I just don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Okay. So Guadalcanal, this is Larry Pinsky, Lindsay Schultz. This is another one that I think doesn't hold up very well, but there's some caveats here. Um, so. Uh, it's, it's, a, you know, the game's about what you think it is. Um, and if you look at the map, you'll see that it's kind of around, you know, it's kind of in that area of Guadalcanal right around Henderson field. Um, and if you're really into this topic, there have been fewer games than you'd like on this topic. It's not really that few, but, but, you know, it's, it's not the East front either. Um, Guadalcanal, uh, Mo's talking about this reboot and the, the, the Mike Nagel Guadalcanal that was recently released from the folks at War Diary is basically an attempt to, uh, to, to modernize this game, Avalon Hills, 1960s Guadalcanal. Um, I didn't say that in the video. And then when Fucko tried, told me that he, I was like ready to argue with him. And then I, uh, I'm like looked into it and I'm like, Oh. No, he's right. He's right. This is actually, uh, you know, that's where that's where that Guadalcanal started. Um, and that looks pretty good. Um, I would pick that up in preference to this. It's basically the same game with obviously much nicer components and not a mounted map, but who cares? Um, so if you and that's this game, by the way. Uh, by Mike Nagel, just released this year from um um, uh, thanks, Mo, for coming, by the way, if I didn't say that. Um, and that cover, that Guadalcanal cover is ghastly. I mean, the game is ugly, too. Let's face it. It's 60s. What do you want? Uh, the Game of Shakespeare by Henry Scott, 1966. Um, I, I'm not sure what this is. Is it a Shakespeare trivia game? Parcheesi with a Shakespeare theme. Okay, if you're into that, cool. If you're not, then you're like me and you're not. Um, I'm not sure. I don't really hate Parcheesi, actually. I got I got to say, but it's not something I want to sink a lot of time into either. Um, tough. Peter Brett, Joan Brett. Um, this one is interesting to me because we had it in our fourth grade class. I think I think it was fourth grade, uh, fourth grade classroom. And I thought at because I you know I that kind of nerd. Um, I thought it was interesting that an Avalon Hill game was there, right? And I'm like, oh, this is weird. This isn't anything like squad leader. Um, maybe it wasn't fourth grade. I forget. But it was it was in the school, right? Uh, and, and it was never played to my knowledge. Uh, but this is like a a, a game with uh, dice with and with dice with numbers and mathematical symbols on them, and then you have to arrange the results of what you rolled into an equation. 
Um, so it's actually kind of neat uh, in an educational game sort of way. So, so oh, I missed that. I missed that. I, I missed that. That's too bad. I never get to catch those because I'm always busy at that exact time. Um, so that sounds fantastic. Mo, we're going to have to talk about how best to get Bill to flip out at the next Compass Expo. We'll, 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 we'll have a meeting about that soon. Um, moving on from tough, we have regatta 1967 boat racing. Again, um, if you're into boat racing or you want a fairly abstract looking game about boat racing, Bob's your uncle here, but that is not something I can meaningfully talk about. Um, here's one that I can a little bit. I've never played Jutland, but, um, or as we call it in Ohio, Jutland. Um, but this is a quite interesting game, um, for a number of reasons. One, it's basically a miniatures game, um, that is played with, you know, you don't have to play it with pieces. You get counters and stuff that you can play it with as well. And here's, here we can see the original, you know, loadout of stuff. Um, but the other interesting thing is that this is a Jim Dunnigan design. Um, this is the game that's kind of infamous for, for being played on a gymnasium floors. Um, and, and Vassal, Mo, we gotta, we gotta start, you know, we gotta ha get on the Vassal train as well. Um, so this is, uh, this is a pretty interesting design. Uh, you know, there's still people playing this. Uh, bluntly, I think, I think if you're gonna play this, I think the way to do it, I think the way to do it is refereed, but um, I also think the way to do this is on Basil or Tabletop Simulator. That way you do not have to, you do not need an entire gymnasium floor. Um, what the support is for this kind of game is in Basil is a great question that I don't necessarily have an answer to. Uh, I am reasonably sure that Tabletop Simulator has the tools to do it. And this is the kind of thing that I would look unusually for me where I would look first to Tabletop Simulator for an online play solution rather than Vassal. Um, that says more about the games I like rather than the either of the two platforms. Um, just going to play easier if it's double-blind. It's not necessarily double-blind, double-blind, but I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's a World War I Mer naval game. Uh, I've seen adaptations of this to World War II or whatever. Uh, which you could totally do. It's a it's an interesting game. I think it's still an interesting game. But we're now getting into late 60s too. Feudal, this is another chess uh, variant from Avalon Hill. And it comes with this board where you get like some kind of, uh, it's basically like chess with, with different pieces and a much bigger board. And then you can set up your pieces, your different pieces that do different things wherever you want. It's kind of interesting, uh, but it's essentially still just a chess variant and therefore not of interest to me. If you're interested in that, great. Uh, Rudy Armendariz, the newer Bismarck. Which newer Bismarck are we talking about? Are we talking about the newer Bismarck from Buka Simulations that like just came out? Because that definitely doesn't. Um, Year of the Lord. Okay, so... Avalon Hill did a small line of religiously themed games. And I always thought that this was a Charles Roberts thing. And it turns out that these all came out after Charles Roberts left Avalon Hill. So exactly what the thinking was behind them doing these religious games, I'm not sure. Um, but this is Year of the Lord. This is highly collectible, by the way. Um, here's a copy in bullshit condition for $200, for example. Um, no price history for this. Okay. Um, but these are, these are highly collectible. There's only like two different ones. We'll see the other one in a second. I've seen this come up at an origins auction and it, it went back when there was such a thing and it went for big money even back at the time. And, and, and you know, a considerable amount of snickering from the, uh, from the crowd. Uh, here's the other one. Journeys of St. Paul, both games designed by Eugene Doherty, by the way. Um, and once again, there's no listings. There's a price history where this sold in good condition for $278. This may, this is anecdotal, so take it for what it's worth. Um, 
I believe, Jeff, I believe this to be the case. It would not be the last. We will get to at least one more today, and we'll get to a couple more moving forward. Um, Journeys to St. Paul. This may be rarer than Year of Our Lord. I don't know, but uh, I've never seen this where I've at least seen the other one at an Origins auction. Bear in mind, I used to like sit in the Origins auction all day, uh, every day that there was an auction, and just like soak up all that knowledge because that was awesome. Um, and they don't have them anymore, which is disappointing, but, uh, 1914 may have been an earlier design, but at least going by the dates on BGG, we haven't gotten to it yet, but here it is 1914, 1968. Um, so I think Jutland was 67. These did come out right around the same time though. So, uh, a, a local buddy actually showed me his copy of this, and this is kind of infam an infamously unfun uh, by the way, thanks, Jeff uh, Beeler, if I haven't said that. Thanks very much for the support. It is much appreciated. Um, 1914 is kind of infamously uh, a great simulation of World War I in that it is a brutal and unfun slog. Um, however, looking at it, and I, and I think that's an accurate assessment, by the way. I, I don't think that that is a fanciful uh, description. I think, it's, I think it's not a game that I... I think most people would enjoy. There are better games on this topic again than than this. But um, 1968 Jim Dunnigan design. There's some really interesting mechanical ideas in this thing. Um, so from that perspective, um, although I can't in good conscience recommend anybody pay a giant pile of money to go run this down. Um, if you have a copy, take a look at the rule book. I mean, there's some really interesting and novel uh, ideas in here. Uh, with hidden movement and and plotted movement and all kinds of other stuff, uh, none of which make the game fun. But but it is it, it is a it is a mechanically very interesting and novel at the time game. Stuka Joe is here. Thanks for stopping by, Joe. Much appreciated. Um, Ventures by Sid Saxon. Uh, this is clearly not the Avalon Hill cover. I got to be honest, I don't remember this at all. Uh, this is the Avalon Hill edition. And, wow, that's not a great cover, is it? Uh, as a Sid Saxon game, if you're into this kind of thing, this might be interesting. Uh, but I'm not really into this kind of thing, so I can't really uh, really comment much on it. Here's Tough a bet, which is like tough. Except you roll dice with letters on them and then make words out of the dice that you rolled. Um, CNO, BNO, Tom Shaw. So, um, again, rail games out of Avalon Hill. And Avalon Hill would do a decent number of rail games over the course of their existence. This one's from 1969. I don't have a lot of insight on this. To be honest about it, I remember this from somewhere, but I've never played it, never owned it, never physically handled a copy. Um, and it looks relatively primitive. Um, so, you know, if you're into rail games, maybe this is an important game in the history of evolution of rail games. I haven't the biggest idea. And we'll be moving on. Uh, here's one I've actually played. Uh, uh, another one, anyway. Uh, Enzio. Now, the, the picture here that you see is the fourth edition, which is, I am given to understand, if you are going to run down a copy of Anzio and the, the edition, I'll show you the edition covers in a second here. They all look fairly different. Um, this is a, uh, this is the fourth edition. This is a Roger McGowan cover. This is a pretty nice cover. Um, this game is also kind of a slog. And for those in the in, uh, reading the chat that wonder what was being meant by soak offs, this is the game that introduced that mechanic to me. Uh, unfortunately, not the fourth edition, because I guess the fourth edition is the best one. It's it's the cleanest one. So the first edition is this. This is the one I actually had. This one with Mussolini on the cover. Weird, but not a bad cover artistically. Um, this is a bad cover uh, with the landing craft and a huge block of text on it. Uh, the map's fairly ugly. And then here's a third edition, and I believe there's a fifth edition fan rules out there. There's also a game called Italia, which is an attempt to basically re redo 
the entire Italian campaign, including Sicily, with this system. Um, that got as far as having maps and counters printed. Um, and I think that was supposed to have been a GMT thing. And I don't know if the licensing fell through or whatever. Uh, but those counters and maps are in circulation. And you can find the rules online um, if you really liked this system. So the soak off attacks idea is a is an idea that is, uh, I think, currently out of favor. And frankly, I have never liked it. it. It basically says that if you are adjacent to enemy units or if you are attacking enemy units, depending on the game, that you have to also attack any other adjacent enemy units. So you've got to like spread your attack mojo around so that um, there aren't unengaged um, enemy units adjacent to your attack. Okay. And I get the... Um, I get the logic behind this mechanism, but frankly, I think it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, I think it's just a pain in the ass mechanic. Lots of games use it, though. Um, this famously used it. Um, the East Front series by Vance Von Boris and GMT uses it. Now, um, also, another game that uses it is Dan Holt's Battle for Normandy, which I've talked about and which I like. I think it's a pretty good game. Um, and that uses Sogoff Attacks, too. But in both the East Front and um, battle for Normandy, um, you have other options besides just attacking on the ground. You can do things like pin those forces down with artillery and stuff like that. So you've got a little bit more options. So um, the mounted counters, this may have been the case, but I'm talking about the ones that Roger McGowan printed. Um, and we're being given away at one point if you were like a bought a immortal subscription to C3I. Um, those are the ones I'm talking about. Somebody else, there may entirely be uh, a uh, uh, somebody else doing these too, though. Uh, Stuka Joe mentions um, and this helps reduce counter clutter. I'm not sure I'm following that, but. Um, I mean, there's as many co counters as there are, and I think that's independent of whether this mechanic exists in the game or not. Um, it may well have been implemented in places as a mechanism by which to reduce counter clutter. That I find completely believable. Um, but I don't know that, you know, for first principles, this mechanic does that. Um, it's not a mechanic that I favor. In addition, um, the map's ugly, uh, but, you know, it's rugged um even for you know late 60s i think this is not a great looking map um at least it's colorful i guess i guess it's got that going for it um um yeah so a uh, of napoleonic battles does too uh but um the unit density tends it depends on the battle it really depends on the battle at least in a lot of cases the unit density will be lower and kind of the then you 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 know the two lines collide um so it works i think okay in some games kind of despite itself let me put it that way um in some cases due to the nature of the thing that they're simulating the topic that they're simulating and its scale and in other cases be, just because it's you know it's a there are other mechanisms in place such that it's a little less obnoxious to actually play. Uh, the stock market game. This is very similar to the previous stock market game, which I think was called the stock market game. I don't know, man. I don't I don't pay attention to these things particularly. They did a bunch of these. Pater. This is another football simulator by alternate names, Data Driven Football, Sports Illustrated Pro Football. Okay, that's interesting. Um, this is one I'm not sure gets played anymore. I'm sure somebody here, um, I'm sure somebody here. Yes, this is exactly, this is exactly it. When we were looking at houses, there was at least a, one or two houses that actually had those old mustard colored appliances from the, the fuck knows what era. Um, all right. So, so this originated as tactical game three. Um, which appeared in s and Magazine, or was it, uh, was it actually in the magazine? It was, it was from s and No, I don't think this was in the magazine. Um, 
Uh, Tim Zale says that pay dirt is still popular, and I frankly find that believable. I mean, these these sports games are still popular, right? Um, so Panzer Blitz is uh, an enormously influential game. Jim Dunnigan designed, but Dunnigan is credited with Tactical Game Three, right? Um, this spawned three direct companion, two direct companion games, three in all: Panzer Blitz, Panzer Leader, Leader in Arab Israeli Wars. Uh, folks are still playing this today. I don't. I kind of see the appeal in it because if you went, if you own a copy, you'll look at the rule book and you'll say, wow, this is like four pages. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's one of those weird sheet rule books. Um, it's roughly the equivalent of four or six pages. It's an incredibly simple game. It's also got significant balance problems, which has led a lot of people to tinker with it, but it's also scalable so that, and a lot of people did this. <coughs> so that if you've got five copies of Panzer Blitz, you can say, Hey, let's, <coughs> Let's play the second Panzer Division versus, you know, whatever Russian army. Um, so in nor obviously in nor where's where's the counter jump count here? Um obviously a normal enormously influential game. Um an all-time classic. I think if you're if you're trying to rank most influential war games of all time, I think this has to be on pretty high on that list i don't think it's the most but it's but it's up there um super influential hugely huge influence on really every single of the many 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 world war ii tactical games that we see nowadays um and i'm not even being facetious when i say many 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 because it's it's a lot um that's annoying well we'll wait on that road order can go here I think we're done clipping for the evening. And it uh, looks like we're going to uh, end more or less on time. <coughs> I do have a couple of uh, housekeeping things at the end, of the, toward the end of the show, though. So, so we'll talk about some of that. Um, anyway, Panzer Blitz, hugely influential. Um, platoon scale, um, geomorphic maps. I'm not sure if anybody else had even done that prior to Panzer Blitz. Uh, but Panzer Blitz definitely did it. Obviously, it was later done with Squad Leader, um, and you know th that whole family of games, and and also it's done in Panzer, right? Uh, James Day's Panzer. So, and and uh, I might add, really slick cover, right? This is a one of those um, really, really, really memorable covers, and it might be the earliest of the really, really, really memorable covers too. Um, so Panzer Blitz, uh, the good news is, um, although, so let me talk about this a little bit, never pay more than $20 for a copy of Panzer Blitz, regardless of condition. Okay. Unless it's in like the shrink wrap or is otherwise minty, minty, fresh and pristine, uh, because it's actually, it's actually, this thing keeps flipping out of that. That's annoying. It's actually really uncommon to find unpunched, let alone shrink wrapped copies of Panzer Blitz because everybody punched it out and played it. Um, so it, unless you get it, and it's quite rare to see that <clears throat> unless you you have, you know, that kind of condition, don't pay more than about twenty five dollars, twenty, twenty five dollars. Uh, here's a very good condition copy for one hundred and twenty five dollars. This dude is insane. Don't pay that. Don't buy anything from him. Um this uh and it's very good it's i mean if it, again if it was in the shrink wrap uh okay maybe that's not crazy but but you know v, i i i interpret v vg very good condition as as punched and played right even if it's well but probably reasonably well taken care of there's uh, copies of that for panzer blitz are a dime a dozen don't don't pay that um but should you pay as a war gamer? This is another one of those games that I would say every war gamer should play this, even if you think eh, this kind of sucks. I really like uh, Combat Commander instead. Um, you will have learned something important by playing Panzer Blitz about the history of the hobby and the evolution of mechanics inside the hobby. And there are still people doing variants and new counters and all that stuff. Um, Luftwaffe designer Lou Zaki. Um, hope Lou's doing okay. This is interesting because it's got round counters. Um, and it is air combat over Germany. This is uh, kind of a strategic air war over Germany. 
Um, this is, a, I think, a lot of folks um, was a lot. This was like really popular. There's a lot of. This is another one where don't pay more than twenty or twenty five dollars for this thing unless it's in absolutely insanely great shape. Um, because there's there's a, a million copies of these floating around. This was in print for decades. Um, it was a lot of people's first war game. Um, I don't really have much knowledge of it. Uh, here's a like new condition for nine, from thirty five dollars. If like new is an accurate assessment of its condition, then I think thirty five dollars is an okay price. Um, but this is not not a collectible, right? Um, but this is an interesting looking game. Um, I'd actually kind of like to try it. Um, I think my personal price point for Luftwaffe is about five dollars, knowing that there's a, there's you know hundreds of thousands of these that were printed over the span of three decades. Um, there's no reason this should be expensive. Um, I just don't have the bandwidth to deal with something like this right now. Kriegspiel, this sucks. Um, it has nothing to do with the historical Kriegspiel. It is a quite abstract strategy game by Tom Shaw that was legendarily designed uh, on the back of a napkin or envelope at lunch or something like that. Um, you could see it's very primitive um, and it is uh, 4.8 on the BGG scale. This is a legendary turd, and it is not um, well regarded. Um, Ed Holtzman says decision did a reprint of Luftwaffe, and I'm wondering is what was that actually called? Because Luftwaffe came from Avalon Hill, and um, not SPI, and decision would not have the rights to it. Um, but that doesn't mean they didn't do something that's very similar to Luftwaffe. I mean. Um, RAF is in the same ballpark, right? Um, you might be able to get enjoyment out of this. There are a few people that say they like it, but I mean, this is the counter sheet, right? There, there's not much to this. You're not going to play this more than once. Try Ream, and now we're getting into the stuff that came out of Avalon Hill's acquisition of Battle Line, Legendary Battle Line, um, which was. Basically, um, Craig Taylor and uh, uh, who was Craig Taylor's um, partner with Battleline? They both ended up going to Yaquinto, and then they were with Heritage for a while. I think that was Yaquinto, actually. Um, or actually, no, it was Battleline. Uh, ba Heritage bought Battleline. Heritage, the miniatures company, bought Battleline. Didn't do well, and then sold it to Avalon Hill, and then Steve Peake and Craig Taylor ended up out the door, and they went and formed the Quinto. Um, I've got this. This is a rarity in that it is an ancient naval tactical game. Um, Ed says it's the same game. Was is I mean, was it called Luftwaffe? Is is what I am actually asking, um, or was it called something else? Ah, uh, Hun six forty four. Thanks very much for coming by. Um, Snooka Joe seems to be, uh, so the consensus seems to be that whatever decision is doing, it was called Luftwaffe, um, which is the question I was answering. So I don't, I was asking, I don't know what the, the providence of that would be. Um, but that is interesting. Uh, I'd be curious to know what the story is behind the licensing on that. Um, and knowing decision, they, you know, put all the original, they, they made all the original mistakes and left them in. Anyway, Trireme, uh, unusual topic. Um, there's a Battle Line version and there is an Avalon Hill version. I have the Avalon Hill version, which should be up above my shoulder. I uh, don't believe you could see it in, in, on Tiny Cam right now. Status Pro Baseball. Um, I'm not sure if we'll, will we get to Status Pro Football. Looks like no. I've played Status Pro Baseball and enjoyed it. And for that matter, which we won't get to tonight, Status Pro Football as well. Um, these are actually fairly simmy sports simulation games. I, I like simmy. Um, so I like this. Um, and there may still be people playing this too. Sports games are not something that I have maintained an interest in. Um, <laughs> yes, I believe so, Mo. Yes, I heard that. Answer that question. All right, just looking at the chat real quick. All right, Speed Circuit, car racing game, no interest. Again, sports simulator. 
Uh, these look kind of neat. Uh, these are little metal cars. This came out of 3M too, apparently. Uh, 3M version had metal cars at least. And here is, oh, that's the 3M version. I've never seen the 3M version. Um, I assumed it was a bookcase game just like that. Sleuth. This is another one where it's probably not the Avalon Hill cover, but this came out of 3M as well. This, I think, is the Avalon Hill picture. Uh, possibly not. Well, in any case, um, classic deduction game from Sid Saxon. Uh, players are searching for a hidden gem, and it's one of 36 cards. Um, the remainder of the deck. This sounds sort of interesting as party games type types of things go i can also tell you that you know there's people that do it that are doing content on on sports games too uh id jester does uh some content on sports games i don't know that i've seen status pro games specifically um uh next up is origins of world war ii uh this is i'm not sure what the design credit is here but i believe this to be a jim dunning and solo design um I might be wrong, and if I am, I could get it off the shelf and look. Where the hell is? Oh, it's on the it's on the bottom because it's because my copy of this is in a slipcase. So 1971 release, uh, Jim Dunnigan. Uh, this is a uh, Stuka Joe has done video on this. Um, by the way, I think this is a very interesting game. I'm not. It's another one of those that I'm not convinced it's particularly fun, and I don't know that you'd necessarily want to play a lot of it. But I think it's a really interesting game mechanically because this really prefigures a lot of the more abstract politics type mechanics that we've seen in later decades. And this is here, Dunnigan doing this in 1971. Uh, and he would do it later in the 70s as well with things like Plot to Assassinate Hitler and other stuff. Um, and uh, the Russian Civil War, for example. But this is a pretty interesting game. Um, I bought this at a Goodwill, I believe, for $3 or something like that. Um, these kinds of conditions are VG for 16 bucks. Yeah, I think that's not, not completely crazy. Um, but this, it's a pretty interesting game. Like I said, it's, you're basically, uh, there's, I believe five player positions and you are competing to put influence in various map spaces. Um, but there's like, you almost like fight it out on a CRT too. When you have, you're like, you're having a political battle but you're fighting it out on a CRT. It's 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 kind of neat, actually. Um, so it very interesting game. Um, wouldn't pay a lot of money for it, but it's uh, it's uh, it's a very interesting game. Um, Image. I don't know anything about this either. Image is a trivia game. They have a historical or fictional character, and then they play cards to describe the person. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that this is a really. I think this is a really great cover. Um, really great cover, and I'm not sure. Um, who the artist was, I'd be curious. Uh, R. Kranz. Uh, only credit, as far as I can tell. That may, They may not have done the cover. They may have done the interior. This could be a painting, uh, you know, that they licensed from somebody. I have no idea. Um, so, uh, you know, not, not a lot of strong opinions on this thing, but the box looks nice. And this came out of 3M as well. Executive Decision, this came out of 3M as well. This is another management game. Uh, very much in line with Avalon Hill's offerings from the early 60s. Um, and it's interesting that we're going to leave off at the end. I mean, this is just 1971, okay? So I don't know that this was released as the last release in 1971. But it's interesting, and I didn't plan this out, uh, that we would stop the, the tonight's exploration of Avalon Hill's stuff with Alexander the Great. Um, because there's a major seismic world altering shift coming to wargaming in just a couple of years. And that is the introduction of role playing games, which were not really strongly distinguished from war games for a long time by a lot of people, even into the early 80s for that matter. Um, and, you know, one of the architects of that was the fellow that designed this game, Gary Gygax. This is a credit to John Greenwood. Um, I understand this game holds up reasonably well. It is Gogamella. Um, the map is not what I would consider attractive, but it's, you know, it's uh, it's 1971 when you want. Um, and the counters are also not, maybe not great, but uh, but supposedly the game actually is, is at least okay. Um, Copies are not typically ruinously expensive. 
um, at least it, you know, even in reasonably good condition. Um, so that I will be happy to to uh, to opine on any uh, other games, but I do want to probably hold off on uh, later Avalon Hill games because we'll get to those in their own episode. Now, um, oh, interesting. Uh, 1998 Origins Auction. Man, I love that auction. It was a great auction. Um, this is true, too. RPGs were originally played by war gamers, but remember, you know, you've got the Klaus... Let me pull this down now. Um, you've got the Klauswitz Hall of Fame, right? Part of the Charles S. Roberts Awards. And if you look at some of the some of the figures in there, you know, for their contributions in the mid seventies, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, right? And debatably, Steve Jackson as well. Um, so the uh, I mean, I'm making an assumption that that is in fact the U.S. Steve Jackson because the list doesn't say. Uh, but I by well, in either case, actually, there were both uh, both U.K. Steve Jackson and U.S. Steve Jackson were both very influential in RPGs and in war games, um, but. Uh, you know, it wasn't considered important enough to distinguish RPG people from, from role-playing people at the time, right? And and those awards were, those particular awards were given in the early 80s, right? Um, for Contra, I believe, so, you know, I'm doing that from memory, but that's the, uh, I, I want to say that's true, very late 70s if it's not. Um, so, you know, there wasn't necessarily as hard a boundary uh, back then between role-playing games and war games. Um, there's reasons for that, right? Other than that, we hadn't figured it out yet where to put the boundary. And I mean, honestly, there's there's still a little bit of fluidity in that boundary, right? There's role-playing games that are war gamier today than other role-playing games. Um, but also because a lot of RPGs back in the day were played as kind of tactical exercises, frankly, right? Um, so they felt a lot like war games, even if you were dressed up in a weird wizard robe, right? So um, in, in that sense, um, you know, the and, and lots of folks blamed RPGs for the decline in, in for a perceived anyway, decline in war gaming. Um, I think that was nonsense even at the time. I mean, that was conventional wisdom for a long time, but I think that was nonsense even at the time. Um, what it may have done is suck a lot of the air out of the room so that uh, pe the, the games that were publicly talked about and maybe played at conventions evolved into role-playing games and then into collectible card games and now into board games, you know, whatever. Um, but I don't know that we've stopped playing war games. Anybody really stopped playing war games to any extent other than people who were convinced that nobody was playing war games anymore, which, 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 you know, was the case with me. Um, Drew Detteris says that B-17 and, you know, by its, uh, by extension, the, that entire genre of narrative focused um, war games, um, solitaire, uh, pretty much all solitaire, as far as I could tell. Um, the, um, uh, there's certainly an, a role playing element to that, right? Um, and it's all you have to do to see that if you, if you like have seen or, or even played B-17 and don't get why there's a role-playing element in it, watch Stuka Joe's B-17 Queen of the Skies playthrough series, and then you'll understand. Um, John Stanley says Chainmail needs a show. I don't dispute that. I think I'm not the guy to do that, though. Um, I am... I have never played Chainmail, and I have a general disdain for early D and D, which I think nowadays is primitive and not worth my time. Those who enjoy it, by all means, have fun, um, but it is not my thing. So I am. I, I think I agree with the statement. I am not the fella to do that. Oh, uh, this is a good point. Although this was not quite the heyday of disco either. I think that was more mid seventies. By about seventy eight, seventy nine, they were setting the records on fire, but. Uh, would be would be uh, at some point. Uh, I have to actually look at the list of games that were done as Avalon Hill games after Avalon Hill got sold to Hasbro, and the list of SPI games that were done by TSR after SPI got sold to TSR. I think both of those might make interesting uh, topics as well. Obviously, this is just part one of of Avalon Hill, actually a, a little, little less time than I expected. 
I, I kind of added as many as I felt I could that I felt we were going to get through. And I guess we got through them. So there will be a part two and probably a part three. I think this is going to be a three part at series. Um, we will not uh, be doing these consecutively, though. So next week, there will be a different topic. So I'm actually going to talk about that. Um, obviously, my it, it, there's a lot of things going on. I've had a couple of fairly busy weeks at work. Um, and I've had, you know, family stuff and holiday stuff and the CSR stuff that has sucked up just an enormous amount of time in the last couple of weeks. So I apologize if, for those who are really looking forward to the week's unboxing on Thursday and I did not deliver. Um, if all goes according to plan and it hasn't, it isn't done yet. So there's every chance that it won't, uh, there will be an unboxing video or something this week. Um, I have wanted to do more playthrough content for a long time now. Um, so I started looking at um, I started looking at um, doing some BCS content. So we'll talk about that in a second while I answer some questions here. Old lady plays, I'd be curious to know which ones you have. I've got about six of them. Five. I have ETO, PTO, Battle Over Britain, Wellington's Victory, and La Grande Armée. Um, ones that I think are probably worthwhile would be Napoleon's Last Battles. Their version of Napoleon's Last Battles is very credible. Um, the Ardennes Quad might might be good. I, I kind of have to take a look at it. Ardennes Quad, their version of Ardennes Quad is, uh, is an interesting cover. Let me put it that way. Um, and there, there's probably a couple other ones as well. So their version of Spies is functionally identical to um, the uh, SPI version as well, other than the box. Um, I'll be glad to watch Ridley Scott's Napoleon movie if it ever gets made. Uh, so Firefight's one that I never did have. Um, and that was done by... That was not an original. There were, there were relatively few originals. There were a couple... Uh, but mostly TSR had, I mean, they were like surprised and appalled when all the SPI people declined to move to Wisconsin from New York City. Um, but uh, because of that, they were really slow off the boat to to uh, to get their own war games off the ground. Um, let me put it that way. Um, Dale Brady, thanks very much. Uh, much appreciated. Always glad to your to have your support and to just to have you in the chat every uh, every week. It's great. Hetzer Sniper. I'm a little unclear as to where Hetzer Sniper fits in as far as it's is it like a standalone or an expansion or uh, um, I'm not sure. I was never sure about that. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I still want to do content though, right? So it's just you know, it's it's there's a, a lot going on right now. And, I, and I'm not neglecting actually gaming, and I haven't actually talked about that, even though it was in the notes that I had for the show to talk about an hour and a half ago. Uh, but I, then I wanted to get through the GMT stuff so we could get to Avalon Hill, because I wasn't sure if it'd be 10.30 by the time we were done. Um, so I mentioned that I'm playing two different bulge games right now. Those, bul those bulge games are Last Blitzkrieg, BCS, which I'm enjoying very much. Um, we have started doing our warm-up game uh, of Goss, of Vakdam Rhine. So I'm getting to see that as well. And I am playing basically the same positions in both games. The Germans on the in the northern sector. Um, the Vakdem Rhine maps cover a little more north to south uh, than the last Blitzkrieg maps do. Um, there's a couple more pieces of uh, another uh, another couple of divisional frontages on the, the Vakdem Rhine map. Um, in either case, though, the Germans really have to have to get started fast. They have to start really strong, or they're gonna they're gonna take it in the face. Um, Kingmaker might need a show of its own. To uh, to be honest, uh, so, ah, good good one, good one, good one. Uh, John Stanley mentioned oh, I got this too, and the reason I didn't mention it when I read them off right now is because it's not in a box. It's just a loose pieces. It's in a baggie somewhere. Uh, it, TSR's Gleam of Bayonets. That's Great Battles of the American Civil War, the old version of the system, the Richard Berg, you know, original. Mm. But it's the only treatment that GBACW has done of Antietam to date. Now, I understand Dick Whitaker and the new team are working on it as well. That'll be great. I'll be delighted to buy that. Um, so... Um, our third winter campaign is just kind of on hold as I am uh, having trouble making it down to Columbus that frequently. 
Um, and actually everything's on hold until January anyway. So, uh, cause that's just, that's just where we are, at least until after Christmas, that's that week between Christmas and new year's ought to be a reasonably sedate week all around. I sure hope so. I have no plans, no, no plans that I have to have to do anything with, um, for new year's. We'll go to a party though, you know, for those listening, you know who you are. Um, but that's, that's it. Um, so Chad Kennedy, I will have a video on this sooner or later, um, probably sometime around late February or early March, because this is our main game for Winterfest again. Um, I like the Goss system. It is quite complicated, but it's really not as complicated as people make it out to be. A lot of the complication in Goss was an illusion based on the shittiness of the rule book. Um, and let's be honest here that, uh, uh, okay, so there's, Think of the Goss rule books as occurring in sort of four phases. Okay, and let's work back from modern. The current version of the Goss rule book is the one that you can download from the Decision Games website right now, and which is pretty. It's a, it's an okay rule book, right? It's a, it's a, it's it's a huge improvement over previous incarnations of the Goss rule book. Um, the the previous version of the Goss rule books. This is not. Um, like an exhaustive version history, okay? I'm kind of giving you the history of the Goss rules, evolution, and waves. Mechanically, there's not that many differences between any of the editions. There are certainly some changes that got made. Some of those are not subtle, but there's no cataclysmic rules changes either. Um, some fine-tuning was done, and that's fine. I expect that to happen as a game system evolves and matures. So, um, the the previous one before this one was the one that was was only downloadable. It never shipped with any games. Now this was the one that Doug Johnson, Doug Johnson, do I have that right? I think Doug Johnson came in um, and kind of did a revision, an, like an editing pass on that rule book. And while it is a an improvement over the previous rule books, the pre the previous rule books are garbage. So. Um, it just and in terms of rules writing and organization and everything, this just insanely difficult rule book. Um, you're making a, a fairly complicated system. I would I would call it an eight out of nine on the one to nine scale that GMT uses. Um, maybe an eight and a half. Um, you're making that into like an eleven because because the rule book isn't clear on so many things, nor is it well organized. So Doug took a pass at that, and, and while that rule book was an improvement, it really needed to be rewritten from scratch, which the, the new version is rewritten from scratch. So if you're interested in Goss, don't just you know open up your Goss game, take the rule book out that came with it, throw it in the wastebasket, and download and print the current rule book, okay? Um, the previous two sort of versions were the ones that came in, um, Atlantic Wall, Hurtkid Forest, and the 2012 edition of Vok Dem Rhine. And then the first Goss rulebook is the one that came in the 2006, I think, 2006 or 2004 version of Vok Dam Rhine. Both of those are, they're, they're, they're very bad rulebooks. They're, they're very bad rulebooks. Um, so Daniel Teach, thanks for stopping by. Much appreciated. Got super nasal in the last 10 minutes here. Um, another thing, as Jeff Taylor mentions, and this is a, this is a problem, Okay. Um, the new charts come with Lucky Forward. They're completely reorganized charts, and they're a, they're also a lot better. They're much better presented. They're easier to read. They're better organized. They give you more information. Um, you get one set of those charts in Lucky Forward, a five map monster game um, that cost two hundred or so dollars when it was released MSRP. And I think that's I think that's a little lame on GMT's part. Next, or not GMT. <laughs> I hate to blame them for this on decisions part. And I said that in the unboxing video as well. Um, the other thing is that um, those are not available electronically. They want you to buy the chart pack, the Goss revised chart pack, which immediately sold out and has not been reprinted. Um, so if you are, if you want those charts and you would like more than one copy of them, you are going to have to make your own photocopies. Um, that annoys me. So, um, I agree. Joe, des Joe Yaus deserves a better publisher. Um, th the thing is, I'm, I, I don't feel like I'm super duper hard on decision, but I also feel like those particular games are maybe not a good fit for decision just because of the way decision 
does things, right? Um, they are fundamentally a magazine publisher and are always like, go, 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 go. Got to meet the deadline. Got to have it out by this time. Blah, blah, blah. Why aren't you done yet? Blah, blah. And that's exactly why we got the Mickey Mouse um, a, a beach invasion mecha uh, mechanism mini game in Atlantic Wall. It was like that was tacked in at the last minute. And you can tell it sucks. Um, it's 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 not engaging. There's not a, really an interesting decision space for either side. And for one side, there's basically no decision space unless it's June 7th and you're rolling uh, panzer battalions onto the beaches. Um, Rock, Lucky Forward has all the latest stuff. Now, you know, you can photocopy this stuff out of Lucky Forward, which obviously is what we will do. Um, but it's it's unnecessary. It's an unnecessary hassle. Um, if the Goss games were done by MMP, which, you know, other than ASL, they're kind of bred... I don't want to say this. I mean, I don't, this is a, a baseless statement to say that the center around which my interest and involvement with MMP pivots is like OCS and the gamers, okay? Um, and to a lesser extent, GTS. But, you know, we're talking about a company that does a lot of big games, but puts a lot of time into developing them and a lot of care into developing them. And it would sure be nice uh, uh, if they paid as much attention, uh, decision paid that much attention. Now, I do think Decision is trying to get better, um, and I think that's why you've only seen like two games from Decision in the last two years, and neither of them were anything more gamers were interested in. That's uh, other than the magazines, and that's uh, uh, also an exaggeration, but still, their release schedule has been real lean the last couple of years. Um, Alan Salazar, thank you very much. Happy holidays to everybody. Um, now, that said, you know, Goss is a, is, a, is a heavy system, but nevertheless, I think there's a lot there, right, to... to to make that mechanical weight interesting. Um, so I will be talking about it more as the as the, the games progress, as we do the local game and the, the game online, which hopefully I'll be involved in next week. I believe that will be the case. Um, so, uh, and by the way, Doug, from the Tabletop's Edge, thanks for stopping by. Much appreciated. Um, it really is, I think, worthwhile um and it's made a lot more worthwhile by the new rule book right the new rule book and new player aids really do make it a lot easier so i mean you've always got that trade-off between detail and simulation value and how much effort i can put into it right some people can put a lot of effort into it some people can't put that much effort into it and and therefore find that i'm just not going to get into that kind of game because i i can't put that kind of time into it um, and that's fine. Uh, the new Axis Empires has been in development for a long time, and it is several years late. Um, however, that said, um, if it is late because they decided they were going to do additional development and make it as good as they could make it, then I will absolutely be happy to give them my money for the new edition of Axis Empires, which is a game system that I do like. Greg Grant says, does starting with Hanute make sense? Um, I think so. I mean, there's a lot in the, a lot of the complexity in Goss is tied into that logistics system with which Hanut just hands you. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, the rest of it is somewhat stripped down. So, so bear in mind that there are some things that I think you'll have to relearn moving up to Goss, but to give Hanut a, a whirl or two, uh, in preparation for moving up to Goss, I think is a completely viable idea. Um, it's also a one mapper with big hexes and big counters. Actually, I think it's just half inch counters, isn't it? Uh, but the hexes are a little oversized, um, which helps because the stacking can get kind of high. Um, I think there's an updated and or expanded rulebook available online, so I would definitely look into that. There is a vassal module for it available now as well, which as usual for decision vassal modules, you have to get from decision from their store. They're free but you have to like check them out as though you were buying something in their store, um, which is clumsy, but it's not a huge deal. I'm not going to make a huge deal about that. There's plenty of other stuff to complain about other than that. All right, folks, it is 10.04, and the timing turned out to be quite good, actually. Um, if we could always manage about an hour and 20 minutes of content, then with the, with the intro stuff and the news and all that other stuff at the beginning, and then general conversation and and interaction with uh, with you nice folks in the chat um that is all great so we've had a pretty good turnout tonight i think we were as high as 100 
just under 140 looks like 139 it looks like was a, was the peak uh that's pretty good i would definitely like to thank everybody thanks patrons uh thanks to everybody remember that you know the patrons get their special shout out but everybody that comes by and watches the show and participates in the chat thumbs up the videos and all that all of you folks are supporting the show supporting our wolf slayer and it is much appreciated so we will be back with you next Monday night at 8 p.m. with another title, with another uh, episode that will not be Avalon Hill Part 2. I want to space those out a little bit. So we'll do something else next week. I haven't decided what that's going to be yet. Hopefully there will be more videos next week. So subscribe to the channel and click the little bell dingus for notifications if you haven't already. Um, by the time we do the next show, before I forget to mention it, we'll be on with Dan tomorrow on Dan's channel. So tune in. I believe we're having... Mr. David Thompson on the show tomorrow. What Dan wants to talk about with David, I don't know, but I'm sure David will be a good sport about it, uh, even if we make fun of him. Um, so, but we will be back uh, next Monday. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Hanukkah, whatever it is that's going on for you in your life. Um, have a good one, and we will see you all next week. <laughs>